In order to run your lab management environment, you're going to need a test controller and some test agents. Now, Lab Manager will automatically deploy test agents into your target environments in most cases. However, we'll still need that test controller in order to set up lab management in our environment. So let's go ahead and install a test controller in our environment and walk through that agent installation process as well. Now, first thing you need to do is download the test controller and agents. And you want to make sure you get the right version for your uh, installation. We're running TFS Update 2, TFS 2013 Update 2, so we want to make sure that we download the agents for Update 2. Now I've already gone ahead and downloaded those agents, so we can go find those in our download folder. And we have our, our agents right here, vs2013.2 agents.enu, and it's a disk image file, so let's right click it and mount that image. Uh, once it's mounted, we can go into the test controller and install the test controller. Okay, it's going to require some space. We need to agree to the license term and whether or not we want to join the Visual Studio Experience Improvement Program and click Install. Once the test controller has completed, we can launch the configuration for it. And we can go ahead and configure this test controller. Uh, we need to specify the login account for it. Where can, we can use local system. We need to register it with a team project collection. Let's go ahead and browse to a project collection. And select our default collection. And if we needed to, we could use a lab service account to communicate with the test controller. Um, we're not going to, to need to set that up right now. Um, these are some other things that we can set up. For instance, load testing. Um, we need to um, unregister it from the TPC if we want to use load testing. So agents are used for either load testing or can be used to run tests. And when they're used to run tests, they're tied to a TPC. So we'll ignore that for now and leave it tied to this TPC and apply the settings. All right, we succeeded. We have a nice clean one. There might be some additional details. We can view the log if we want. The warnings are generally for the uh, openings that were made to the firewall. Let's go ahead and close. And close. So in this case, we've installed and configured our test controller for use. Um, let's do the same now for our test agent. Once again, agree to the license term and click install. Once the agents installed successfully, we can launch their configuration as well. And we have to decide a couple things. Test agents can run either as a service, a Windows service, or as an interactive agent. Um, if they run as a service, um, you can't interact with the desktop, so they can't run um, UI tests, which actually fire up things like IE or Chrome and then start clicking through the browser. That needs to run as an interactive process. Uh, I'm going to run the agent as a service in this case. We'll click Next. We can log on as the network service or provide a username and password. If you're going to run them with, uh, on the interactive service, you will need to provide a username and password. And then we can register with an existing test controller. Now the controller we have running is SRV. 19428. Okay, and our configure configuration has started. A couple things. Uh, we don't have necessarily administrator privileges. We might need to have that for the test agent, depending on what the test agent is going to do. And we need to restart our machine uh, for those group membership settings to take effect. Let's go ahead and close that and close our test agent. Now, in this demonstration, we've installed and configured both a test controller and test agents, which we're going to need for lab management, but you may need for other implementations outside of lab management as well. Be sure to install the agents that match the version of TFS that you have installed. Uh, that helps keep everything in sync nicely, and especially when you're doing a new clean install. You don't want to install uh, different versions of agents than you have your TFS environment.
One last thing to note, I installed the test controller and test agents on my TF, TFS application tier server or on one of the application tiers. That's probably not your best practice. Better instead to install and configure those somewhere else, um, on a separate machine somewhere, on a build controller, um, especially the agents themselves. You don't want to be running a lot of uh, tests, etc on your TFS server. Leave that nice and clean and not, not executing a bunch of tests and whatnot. So that's just some advice. Move it to a different server somewhere. If you have to run the test controller on the server, that's probably okay or it's much better, but try to keep the agents off that machine. In this demonstration, we're going to be installing a base install of System Center Virtual Machine Manager for lab management. And to do so, it's a relatively straightforward install. The uh, first thing we need to do is download the appropriate ISO, and I've pulled down the 2012 R2 Virtual Machine Manager, and I'm going to mount that ISO. At this point, we can run the setup for Virtual Machine Manager. Now, Virtual Machine Manager is required for doing TFS lab management if you're going to use the virtual environments. Now, there's ways to get around it and talking about physical environments, which can point to Hyper-V, VMware, an actual physical environment, lots of other things you can do. But in this case, we're going to install System Center Virtual Machine Manager because it's required for kind of the big install. Now, there's a couple of things you might want to note. There's a release note, an installation guide, browse the CD, um, take a look at the VMM configuration analyzer. Um, optional ones is install a local agent on this machine. Gives you a warning, restart may be required, and before you begin, a little link, which brings you out to Microsoft and talks about how to deploy System Center uh, 2012 Virtual Machine Manager. And this kind of walks you through how to do that installation. We're going to head closing that and run through the actual install steps. Now this is going to be a basic install. Um, you may need to do a much more sophisticated install depending on your needs for, um, well, for System Center Virtual Machine Management or for lab management. So System Center Virtual Machine Management is much, much larger than lab management. Um, lab management uses a subset of the Virtual Machine Manager. All right, we can have a couple features we want to install. I'm going to install both the management server and the VM console, both of those. Click Next. We need to provide the registration information. Um, we're going to be installing the Evaluation Edition in this particular case. However, you could then provide your organization and your product key at this location as well, um, if you have that product key. Next, read the license agreement, understand it. Um, you should probably actually read it. I'm just going to skip through it quickly. Next, do you want to um, participate in the customer evaluation? Yes or no, depending on your choice. Give a location for the install. Now, this gives you the prerequisites and where it cannot continue. Now, if we take a look at this, the deployment tools and the Windows um, pre-installation environment features are not installed on this computer. So first, um, we're going to need to install those. So we can go here and get that at the Windows Assessment and Deployment Kit. Download those. Open the folder and then run that setup. We're going to choose to install it right on this computer. Note that it does have a pretty large chunk of space required. And I always join the Customer Experience Improvement Program just so I get a better experience in the future. At this point, we can select the things we need to install. Um, those things that are, are highlighted are the defaults. We're going to leave those defaults. That's what we need for our tool, and let's install. Once the prerequisites are installed, we can go back to our installation and check those prerequisites again. Uh, this time looks good, except we have some command line utilities that are not installed and a link to go get those. We just kind of walk through this process, ensuring all of our 
prerequisites are installed and everything's ready to go. Let's grab the SQL Server 2012 pack, grab that link ID and off we go again. All right, we need to pull down the appropriate pieces from the instruction pack. This was just the, um, the text. We need to find what we need and then go grab that for our implementation. And we need the command line utilities. So let's scroll down to find the command line utilities. There we go, the SQL Server 2010 command line utilities. And that's going to require the SQL Server native client and Windows installer 4.5. Um, we need to make sure that we have both of those installed on our machines and we'll be able to do that by simply running the install package. But first, let's grab that native client and we're gonna grab the x64 package for our installation. And let's grab our command line utilities. And let's go ensure we have Windows Installer 4.5 installed. We're going to actually try the installation because I believe Windows Installer 4.5 is already installed. So let's go to our download folder again. Run our native client. Okay, we already have it installed. We're ready to go. Let's do the command line utilities. Once more, let's close things up, clean things up a little bit. And check our prerequisites again. All right, we're clean. Now we need to point to a database. Where is the database we want to use for our VM management server? We do need to have a, an existing database. So let's point back to our same database as TFS is sitting on. Uh, we can use the following credentials if we like. Let's choose an instance name. Okay. And we'll create the virtual manager DB. We're logged in as the person with appropriate credentials all the way across. So we're not going to need to provide a different one and click next. The virtual management system account. Let's use a local system account. And um, we're doing the simple, uh, the simple installation. So we're not going to use distributed key management. Specify all of the ports. We're going to leave the default ports. Create a new library share. We'll call it our, just give it the same default name. And at this point, we read the install summary and we're ready to install. Once the installation is complete, we've got the server and the console completed successfully. We can check for updates and open the VMMM console when the windows closes. We're not going to go ahead and do that. We'll simply close it and we are done. We've completed a basic installation of System Center 2012 R2. With System Center Virtual Machine Manager installed, we can look at creating things like libraries and, and whatnot. So let's open up the Virtual Machine console. We're going to connect directly to localhost using the current identity. You can automatically connect with these settings if you like as well. Now, a quick thing on Virtual Machine Manager, absolutely wonderful tool, uh, very powerful, and we need it in order for us to be able to operate effectively with lab management. So let's take a look at some of the, the various pieces here. We've got VMs and services, and we've got the fabric itself, and that allows us to connect 
network, network and storage and things like that. We have our libraries. Let's click down here and we can see several of our libraries. We have library servers and by default where we just installed it was a library server. And here we can open it up and see we've got our default library. And if we go in and look at the application frameworks, we already have some um, existing uh, resources here and some existing VHDs like a blank disk for a small, large, etc. VHD. So let's go in and if we want, we can right click here and add a library share. Now a library share is a way for us to share for lack of a better term, share VHDs among lots of other servers. So we can spin up a new uh, instance of a template application that we have here. Um, let's create this library share in my C colon backslash my library share. Basically, what I've done is I've created a file share and that's where we establish this library shares to add. Now we can add some default resources here. We could do some other things as well and click next. This is going to add a share that we can then use as part of System Center Virtual Machine Manager. It will automatically install, um, DMM will install the agent on the new library servers. We're running locally on our machine, so not such a big deal. Add the shares and wait for it to complete. Okay, once it's completed and we've set the library through, so we can close it. And now we have my library share and uh, we set some default things in here. So we have some of our application frameworks, like things like web deployment frameworks and whatnot um, that we have that we can enable. Um, in this demonstration, we've walked through creating a library share inside of a library server, and we can then use these as we start embarking on lab management. Compiling and executing code is one of the most important things that's done by a software development team. And Team Foundation Server supports a build engine called Team Build. And Team Build is used to basically do compilation, sometimes run, running tests, occasionally deployment of code, all of those things involved in making sure that your application can compile successfully. So let's take a look at how we install that capability. And to do so, we use something called a build controller and a build agent. So let's open up our Team Foundation Server Administration Console. And if we wanted to install a build controller, we do so from this page. Now, Notice this is on my application tier. Um, I don't mind putting a controller on an application tier, but a best practice is not to install a bunch of agents on your Team Foundation Server application tier. And the reason behind that is agents tend to be very greedy when they're doing compilation with both processing power and sometimes disk IO. So what you wanna do is push those off onto other servers and you can move the build controller off to those servers as well. If you didn't have the Team Foundation Server Administration Console and you just want to put a build controller somewhere, you simply install TFS on that machine and specify that you want to set up a build configuration. Basically, it gets you to the exact spot we are here, except that instead of clicking configure installed features, it automatically does that for you. It gets you to here. So if you already have TFS installed and you haven't done any configuration, select the build configuration and click configure installed features. If however, you don't have the administration console, simply install TFS and it'll say, what component do you want to install? You simply select the build component and it'll get you to this screen, the Team Foundation Server Configuration Center. So we're configuring the Team Foundation build service. Let's go ahead and start the wizard. By the way, you'll notice that we have an, an uh, application tier and SharePoint products on this server. We're going to configure the build service, however, on this server. Click start the wizard. And we're going to walk through a very simple wizard. Do we want to participate? Sure. We'll, we'll help Microsoft make better products. The next thing we need to do is specify which team project collection this build controller is tied to. Now this is a restriction. Build controllers can only be tied to one TPC. So because of that, you'll need to specify very carefully which TPC you want 
to be tied to. Now, if you have multiple team project collections, you'll need to have multiple build controllers, generally running on separate machines. So let's take a look. We're going to tie to our default collection. Uh, we could hit browse and we could also we have our off-site collection that we could tie it to our off-site collection. Now I'm going to tie it to our default collection because we've got so, that's where our, most of our work is. This off-site stuff, we don't have much there. So let's connect to our default collection. Notice that it found zero build controllers and zero build agents running on zero machines. Well, that's obvious. We haven't set anything up yet. However, What's interesting here is if you have other build controllers and other build agents on other machines, it'll automatically pick that up and say, hey, by the way, you've already got, say, two other build controllers tied to this default collection with 10 other build agents and running on a total of eight machines or something like that. So you can kind of get an idea of how big your network is for this. We're going to tie it to our default collection. Simply hit next, and then we're going to go into build services. This is basically, do we want any of the build agents installed on here? Um, we're going to use the default setting here, the number of build agents. This is going to be the build controller and build agents. We can say we want no build agents on this machine if we like. Basically, this is the application tier. I might not want to run any in production. Since this is... A course, I'm going to say one, the recommended amount. Um, the number one comes from the number of processors on this box. Uh, we've got one proc on the box, therefore it's recommending that I do one. So we're going to stick with one. You can also configure it later, but you have to configure it before you can start running builds. So I am going to put the controller on this machine as well as one agent. Again, we could put as many agents as we want on. Um, I would probably not tend to go too far beyond the recommendations, however, unless you have a very good reason. We'll stick with one, click next. What do we want to run the Team Foundation build service as? Do we want to use a specific user account or do we want to run it as network service? There's a couple of reasons you may want to run it as network service, I mean as a, a user account. That's because you might want to grant permissions to drop folders and stuff more easily than you can with network service. You, you, know, you have to remember to put the machine name and then the dollar sign at the end with network service. All depends on, on how you want to set it up. I'm going to go ahead and use the network service. Don't have a problem with that. Let's hit next. We can review all of the various things. Here's going to be the new controller name. We can scroll down. It's going to run as a network service. It's going to tie to this default collection and it's going to run over port 9191. Now we can change that later if we like. Click next. It's going to run through some readiness checks. Everything's passed. We're happy. We can then click configure. Once it's run, we have now been able to install our build agent. Let's click next. You can see the success and we can close. We now have installed a build agent and set it up on our Team Foundation server application tier. The agent, one agent, and the controller. Once a build controller and build agents are installed on a machine, there's some configuration that can be done against those build agents. Let's take a look at some of the things that we can do for both configuring build agents and build controllers. First thing to do is open up our Team Foundation Server Administration Console and go to the Build Configuration tab. We can see that the build service is configured and it's running as the network service. We can set properties for it, stop it, restart it. The first thing we're going to do is this is the build service. So these are this is the actual service account that's running on that machine. We then have a build controller and build agents. So let's take a look at what we can do with that server. We can hit properties and we can see several properties. The first is that we're providing build services for this TPC, the default collection. And here's the where we're going to listen for the build agent communication. Generally, you're never going to change that. What should we run the service as? And uh, when we connect to TFS, should we connect the same identity as this Windows service or a different identity? We'll take the service identity as the default. Now, there's one more thing here. We can run the service 
interactively. And I want to talk about what that means. When you click to run the service interactively, what that allows the service to do is interact with the user interface. So when would you want that? Let's say that you have a build that does a compilation and after it does the build, it quickly deploys the app to a location, maybe a website somewhere, and then you want to walk through a coded UI test where it actually opens up a web browser or opens up a, a WPF app and it starts clicking through that app just to make sure that it's successfully built. In order to do that, you need to run the service interactively. If you don't, then you won't be able to actually run those coded UI tests. It's a security mechanism for for services. Services normally can't interact with the UI. Now, if you want to change any of these things, you need to stop the service. Then you can make changes. Once we've stopped the build service, we can then choose to run this interactively if we want. Um, I'm not going to run it interactively. Um, you can also run uh, Windows Store unit tests. You need a developer license to do that in a particular certificate. Those are things you would do if you're writing apps against the, uh, the Windows App Store. Let's go ahead and start this service again. And you'll see now the controller and the agents are both initializing. They're ready now. And let's talk about how we can then do the same thing, make changes to the controller. Let's go to the properties of the controller itself. And we can give the controller a description. We can change its display name. And what computer it's running on, can't change that. Now, another thing here is a version control path to custom assemblies. Now, in a lot of cases, when you're running a build, a, a compilation, there might be dependencies that you take that are outside of your application's dependencies. So your application may not need to have um, a DLL local to it in the application. It's something that's dependent that the machine itself has installed potentially. Um, I've seen people use this for um, unit testing DLLs and the like. So if you have custom assemblies and you've stored them in version control, you can specify this version control path to those custom assemblies and it will download them as part of the build. I'm leaving that blank for now. Next, how many concurrently running builds do we want? And we can default to the number of enabled agents. In our case, that's one on this machine. We'll only have one agent running. Now, we could also have multiple build agents running on other machines, in which case we could specify that there's more or just the number of enabled agents. If we've got 10 agents, it'll default to 10. I'd leave that default. You can also disable the controller. In this case, this controller is no longer active and will no longer be running any builds. You might want to disable something if you're doing some maintenance work or whatnot. Let's leave it enabled and click OK. Next is the agent itself, and we can check out the properties for that agent. Now the property has several, the agent has several different properties, um, including which controller it's bound to. Now we only have one controller here, but it's bound to that controller, the name it's running on, the name of the agent itself, and you can change this to something different if you like. The working directory, an agent, when it does a build, needs to pull down all of the source code. So it's going to pull all the source code down and sit that source code locally. And this is the folder that it's going to drop it to. The system drive, whack builds, whack the build agent ID, whack the build definition, path, and we're done. And we can also disable just this build agent if we want for some reason. Now there's another tool called tags, and I'm going to add a new tag to this one. And this tag might be, this is for our um, non-Windows Store. So anything that's not running in the Windows Store, because we didn't enable that. So the non-Windows Store, we could, we, could, we could run any non-Windows Store builds on this server. Um, we might also, let's say we had Java enabled on this, on this box, we could say um, all of our Java builds occur here. Now, tags are just that. They're only tags. So there's nothing to check that Java's um, enabled on this machine, etc. However, we can then use them when we have a build. We can say, I want to trigger this build on any build agent, but they have to have Java enabled. So we could use that tag to go find that particular build agent. So in this demonstration, we've seen how we can set up a controller or a 
a service, a controller, and an agent and basically configure those to work most effectively when we're doing software development builds. At some point, you're going to want to scale out your infrastructure for your builds. So for instance, you may have a build controller and a few build agents running on one or one machine, but you may want to bring that out to another machine. And we're going to do that by installing the build service and build agents on another machine. Let's go ahead and do so. To do so, we simply run the installation package for Team Foundation Server. So we have that locally right here. And you can run that install for TF Server. Now, in our particular case, if I install now, it'll, it'll note that it's already installed. And it's going to simply launch the configuration center. This is exactly what you would do if you'd ran the install and it needed to walk through the installation process. But notice here we have the build foundation service. We're going to configure the build foundation service. And if you want to come through through the TFS administration console, please see the introductory section for this because there we simply walk to this screen from the team foundation server admin console. Here we ran it through the install of TFS. If you're on a clean machine, this is how exactly how it would run, except you wouldn't see these two things checked. We check the configure team foundation build service and we start the wizard. And similarly to setting up a new one, we simply make a few decisions. We need to tie that to an existing uh, team project collection. And it already found one build controller and one build agent running on one machine. That's the existing infrastructure that we have. We're going to want to tie to that and expand it out. So let's click next and we might want to scale out our build services and we could add some more machines. For instance, we could add two more build agents to run on this machine. Once again, the recommended number is one in this case because I'm running with one processor. Running with two processors, the recommendation is two. Just kind of a default. I'm going to go with two on this one anyway. And I want to add the capacity to the following build controller. In other words, I don't want my own build controller on this machine. I simply want to add the capacity to this following, to that build controller. Alternatively, I could replace the existing build machine. That'll go ahead and deactivate that one and make this one the core build machine. Um, I'm just going to extend it out, build it out, or I could, of course, configure later. Let's click Next. We're going to use a system account for this one as well. Do a quick review. Um, we want two agents. We want to scale this one out. Click Next. Run some readiness checks and configure. Once the configuration is complete, we can click Next and just get our review of the results. Note that a firewall exception was added for port 9191. That's the default port that it, that it uh, talks over, that the build agent talks over. Let's close it. And we are now done. If we go into the administration console and look at the build configuration, you'll see we have the two agents running. There is no controller on this machine. It's just agents. But we could, if we wanted, um, add a new controller here. Um, like other ones, we have our service running here, and it's got its own properties. We would go in here, for instance, to set it if it was an interactive process. And we have our agents. And we can go into the agents and view the properties of the agents and do things like add tags. This might be for our uh, Windows Store compilations. So Windows stores might be we want to develop or deploy uh, run only on this agent. Other than that, the configuration of these agents is the same as any other configuration. So in this demonstration, we've gone into a new machine and we've installed just agents, not controllers, to scale out our build infrastructure. We now have three agents and one controller, and that one controller will pass the builds and distribute them between those three agents. You may find that you need more than one team project collection. Now, there's a couple reasons for this. The first reason is you really just need to keep the data completely separate from one another. So no version control will span. You can't branch from one to another. Security settings are completely different. They can be far more isolated in one team project collection than another team project collection. 
Or it may be, for instance, that you are working with another company and you want to then give them all of the source code and history and everything. If you want to do that, you could create a separate team project collection and put your code in there. Now for internal development in an organization, I don't recommend having a lot of different team project collections. You want to keep things relatively tight. However, there are cases, like I just mentioned, that you may want to add another team project collection. So let's go ahead and do so. To do so, we're going to go into Team Foundation Server and we're going to go into the Administration Console. In the Administration Console, here we are at the App tier, right below that we're going to see a list of all of the Team Project collections that we have. Now in our case, we just have the default collection that we started with we may want to create another collection, a secondary collection, uh, maybe for off-site work or something like that. To do so, very simply, all we have to do is click Create Collection. Now, I want to talk a little bit about what this entails. When we click Create a Collection, it brings us up this nice little wizard, and we're going to walk through it. Now, there's a lot of different areas, and you have to have some pretty substantial permissions to be able to do this. This user happens to be a farm admin on SharePoint. They happen to be an SA on the database as well as an administrator of TFS. That's basically the kind of security profile you're going to need to be able to do this. So let's go ahead and type a collection name here. This could be our offsite. We're going to maybe do all our offsite development against here. I don't know. Um, you can provide a description for it if you like and click next. We then need to point to a data tier. Now, one of two things happens. We need to create, we can create a new database or use an existing empty database. Here's the distinction. The only time you want to use an existing empty database is when you don't have admin rights, those SA rights against the database server. If you don't have those rights, you need to have somebody else create the empty server and then, or the empty database, and then you point to it here. However, if you have the appropriate permissions to create a new database, just simply use the create a new database for this collection. Point to the SQL Server instance you're interested in and click next. Next thing you have to determine is where the SharePoint sites are going to live. Now, here we have the web application. This is the SharePoint portal that we have. We're going to leave that as, as it is. And it says a SharePoint site will be created for you at this location. So as part of the collection, we're going to create this site's WAC offsite. It's based on the name of the, the team project collection that we're using. And then when people create new team projects, they'll appear right here, offsite WAC project name. Now there's some advanced configurations we can set. We can say we want to use an existing SharePoint site. So you can point to an existing SharePoint site if you like, or you can say, you know what, don't create a SharePoint site at all. But if you don't create one, um, you'll have to then create one later or nobody will be able to create SharePoint sites um, as when they create their team projects. We're going to go ahead and create a SharePoint site at that specified location. And then we're going to move to reports. Same thing on reporting when we do the configuration there. We have we define where that place is. Here it's the server 19430 slash reports. That's where our um, SQL Server reporting services is. And we can specify a path to an existing folder or not create reports. Again, we're going to create reports at that default location. Next, we're going to specify some lab management information. Now, do we want to configure lab management for this? Uh, yes or no? We have not enabled um, lab management, so we're not going to do so. We'll leave that blank and move on to review our configuration. At this point, we can verify it, runs through some very fast verification tests, and we click, click Create. Now this, again, it goes and creates a database in the data tier. It creates a SharePoint site at that SharePoint location. It creates a new reporting site for us that will host all of our team project reports. And finally, it creates um, all of the access and stuff necessary inside of Team Foundation Server itself. Once the creation process is complete, you can scroll down, notice that everything is completed, click Next, 
and complete to be done. Now, if you run into an error, and it's not uncommon to run into errors uh, when creating a team project for the first time, likely it's permission. There's a lot of different permissions that kind of are working together to make things happen. So if you happen to have um, a failure, it will likely be either on the SharePoint side, the database side, or the reporting services side. So you're going to need to make sure that the service account has the right permissions, the, uh, that you have the right permissions, and that um, they're all specified in the appropriate spots. Now you can see the session on uh, setting up security if you have any difficulties and you run into any problems with security. But in our case, we didn't. We've created our team project collection. Let's hit close. And now we have off-site our new team project collection. Now all of those settings that we did when we were doing it, we still have access to these settings. So take a look at this. We've got the general instance. This is where it is. Here's how you can locate it. Um, we can edit some of these settings. With edit settings, we can add a description here if we like and save it. We can cancel it. Um, we can take a look at group membership. This is the security at the off-site team project collection level. So this is where we could administer security at this very, very high level. This is almost at an entire server level, but, but still inside of the software. Um, administering security is where we don't do group membership, but we allow particular things to happen. We can then stop the collection. Um, you can click stop the collection here, and it'll ask you for a reason it is being stopped. So if anybody tries to connect to it, they'll get this reason popped up. Maybe you're doing maintenance, maybe you're doing something, who knows. I'm not going to actually stop it here. And then we can detach the collection. That's to, to really take it away from TFS and maybe move it somewhere else. We can look at the status, and we can see that we have a couple things that ran. Uh, we created a collection and prepared the collection, or rather prepared the collection, then created it. If something had a failure here, you can always rerun that job from here. We can see the team projects inside of the TPC. Now on a newly created TPC, there won't be any team project collections here at all. Um, the SharePoint site itself, um, this is where we specified the SharePoint site. If we didn't like that, we can edit that default site location from here as well. We don't have to do it when we're creating the TPC. We can do it at any time after as well. And the same thing is true with the reports folder. We can edit that default folder location for the reports folder right from here as well. Now you want to be cautious doing this. That default one, if somebody has already created um, some team projects and they have those report sites, this won't actually move any of the report sites. It's just new team projects will be added to the new location. So it'll kind of split it across. So you may or may not want to do that. I'm um, generally try to get it right the first time and run with it, but if you have to change it, you can change it here. So in this demonstration, we've created a brand new team project collection called Offsite. That Offsite has its own database in SQL Server, its own um, folder or, or location, project site for SharePoint, and its own reporting folder as well. One thing I do want to note, that we have two team project collections in this TFS environment. By default, even though they're very, very separate, and the security is set separately and everything. Both of these use the same data warehouse and the same OLAP cube. What that means is that you don't want to put any like really sensitive, um, maybe names of, of work items in the offsite one if it's going to be rolled into that same reporting engine. So just, just to be aware of that, usually not a problem, but something to be aware of. In this demonstration, we're going to be talking about managing team project collections as well as team projects, kind of differentiating the two. Now to manage a team project collection, you need to go to the administration console on the TFS server or one of its app tiers. So let's go ahead and go to that team foundation server administration console. And once we're in the TFS Administration Console, we can look here at our application tier. We'll see all of our application tier data. And then underneath it immediately is the team project collections. So here's where we start to do that administration. We can create collections, attach collections, etc. We're talking mostly in this demo about managing those. So let's take a look here. We have our default collection. We can see its status. 
right here. Um, this is all of the logs or the, the um, jobs that have run, like attach a collection. Um, if you double click that, you can go ahead and see the log for attaching collection. We can look at the team projects. Here are all of the team projects within it. Um, you'll notice here that I can highlight a team project like the verification project and delete right from here. This is a very powerful way to delete. Normally you would have to go to the uh, command line and type TFS delete project, but you can just go here and delete immediately from here as well. Next thing to take a look at, oh, uh, but let's note, you don't create a team project from here. That's done inside of Visual Studio, Web Access, some of those other techniques to create those. Let's take a look at the SharePoint site. This is where the SharePoint is located for this entire collection. Now it's the default site location. So if we open it up, we're going to say that if a new team project is created and we ask it to build a SharePoint site, we want it to be placed here in Sites WAC Default Collection. Now, if for some reason we didn't like Default Collection here, we could just say something like Sites WAC DC, a shortened version of Default Collection, and it would automatically create any new projects right there. Now, for our purposes, we're going to leave that as Default Collection. Just because we've created some, we want it consistent. And we can do the same thing for our reports folder. We can change our default location for our TFS reports folder. Now, in our case, we don't need to change that as well. But those are where you would manage your team project collections. Let's go back to general one more time. There's a few other items that we should look at. We can stop the collection for any reason. And when we stop it, we can give a reason for stopping it. And anyone who tries to connect to it will then be prompted with this reason. We can edit various settings on that team project collection. Like for instance, in our case, we can give it a description. This is the default collection. Click save. And it'll go ahead and update that on the server. Next, we can take a look at the group membership, who belongs to this TPC at the TPC level, the team project collection level. So we're not looking at team projects. What this is useful for is for granting administrator rights to potentially an, an individual or group of individuals for the team project collection. So as an administrator, you can maintain control of the team foundation server, but allow the team foundation or allow project collection administrators, maybe de senior dev leads to manage the project collection. You can also go in here and um, handle things like the project collection build administrators who are anonymous users, proxy service accounts, etc. You can click close and then what security is available is managed through the administer security button. So we can go and say that project collection administrators have the following permissions. And basically they can do everything with the exception of make requests on behalf of others. Um, the service accounts have another set of permission and we want to potentially grant or remove permissions for that from them as well. And that's how you manage a team project collection. Now to manage a team project, we need to go into Visual Studio or the web. Now that I'm in Visual Studio, we can start to manage a team project. To manage a team project, we'll open up our reporting project and we can go to settings here as well. And notice that we have a lot of similar things to manage for the team project. You also have a link here to manage some team project collection attributes itself. Things like group membership and security can be administered from here as well. Notice that it pulls up a web browser to allow you to do that, that security and configuration. Um, this is true, um, especially for um, project collection administrators who don't have access to the actual TFS server itself. So they would go in and do their manipulation through this web UI. Let's go in instead to the team project settings and take a look here. We can set up security and group membership. Once again, it goes to the web. And you can see we can set up things like, um, what are the permissions here? The default team project, 
who are the members of this reporting project team. Currently, it's just the administrator. Who are the build administrators? We don't have any. Who are contributors? We have everyone in the reporting project team is a contributor. If I go back and look at that again, once again, it's just the administrator. We haven't added any other people, but we could certainly do so. Other areas that we can set up is we can take a look at the overview of our reporting project. And we can create sub teams underneath it. We can look at iterations, create areas and iterations. Once again, the areas and iterations is something we'll be covering in a different module. Areas are very similar to iterations. We can set up the security, the alerts, and also any version control configuration we can do here as well. So security at each level of our project. So we could actually add security at a very granular level. So any folder under reporting project, we could add some security to, for instance. So in this demonstration, we've seen how we can administer both a project collection as well as administering a team project. And often they will have different people administering them. You might have a team foundation server administrator, that may be you, someone who understands and has the IT-based permissions, and then you may grant the team project collection administration to someone from the development staff who happens to be relatively senior. And then they might grant team project administration rights to someone one step below them with it needs to manage the security and the permissions and the behaviors of individual team projects. Sometimes you need to move a team project collection from one server to another. And there's some basic steps you need to go through. Let's demonstrate how that might happen. First thing we need to do is open up our team foundation server administration console and look at our collections. Now this one here says other org. We need to move it to another location. And by simply selecting it, we can go down below and detach the collection. You can also stop the collection if you need to. Detaching will allow us to stop as well. Give a servicing message. We're moving this permanently. Click Next. Review some configurations. Click Verify. It's going to run some readiness checks. It's going to give us a warning, and you're often going to get warnings on SQL Server Enterprise. In other words, I'm moving this to, I need to move it to another SQL Server Enterprise server, or I need to do some kind of back off magic that I can do um, if I need this to work in a SQL Server standard. If you do need to move from Enterprise to Standard, please go check the documentation online on how to do that. Readiness checks are done. I'm detaching the server. Now, when I detach the server, it's basically going to the configuration database and telling it this TPC is no longer going to be available. And inside the team project collection itself, it's making a lot of changes to say, I don't know what environment I belong to. And it's basically cleaning it out, doing a bunch of configuration and processing, making it so it's a a package that can be then sent to another location. We've completely detached it. We're done and we can click close. And at this point, it's detached. It's done. Now, we can't actually move this over. We move the SQL Server database from a detached collection somewhere else. So the next thing we need to do is get into SQL Server itself so we can move that over. Once we're over at the SQL Server, we open up SQL Server Management Studio. And one of our da databases is this TFS Other Org database. Now, a couple things we can do. Uh, one of these is we can back it up. We can detach it. We just need to somehow get this database gone. So let's go to Tasks, and we need to package it up and get it somewhere else. So we can detach it. Um, I like the Backup Restore options. I'm going to do a backup. TFS Other Org, I'm going to do a full backup, and we'll call it TFS Other Org Full Database Backup. It's going to put it in this directory right here as a .bac file. Click OK. The backup of the database, TFS Other Org, completed successfully. Let's go there. We've got that, that backup, and we can go find that backup out here if we like. It's on the C drive.
and we've got our other org.back file. I'm going to copy that and just place it for the time being on my desktop. And the reason is I'm pretending I'm taking this off to another location. So let's completely eliminate this. We're going to take this and we're going to detach this database. Um, we might even might even go so far as delete it. Let's delete this database so that it's just gone. Close existing collection connections. Now that database is just gone, gone. We've deleted it completely. Now we need to move to another TFS or another SQL server. So in a move, we're simply going to take this database now that I've copied to the desktop. We can see it's here out at the desktop. This is our backup file, and we're going to email this, we're going to sneaker net it, whatever, to get it to the next Team Foundation server. Once we get it to the next TFS implementation, we're going to restore it into our SQL Server. So we can go back to SQL Server, and on our databases, we can restore a database. And for the database we want to restore, let's uh, choose it from a device. That device is going to be a file. We'll choose our backup media. Now, we could use the other org that was backed up here, but if we want, we can go all the way into our backup that we have hosted on our desktop. Actually, this is SQL Server. Let's keep it just to the one that's in the backup media. Much easier to grab it from there. I'd copy it down into here. There's some magic you have to do to get it to show up on other places. We'll just grab this one. We know it's the same. Click OK. Click OK. And let it restore that database. We can verify the backup. We're going to bring it back to TFS Other Org. We could rename it if we want. And at that point, we can hit Enter. And that restores our database. So now we've moved it to the new server, quote unquote, new server. Again, whether or not it's a new one or the same one is completely irrelevant. But at this time, I have my TFS other org database. Now we go back to the new Team Foundation Server Administration Console. All right, we're back over at the TFS um, application tier. We open up our application tier, and at this time, we've got the collection we want to bring in. And we can pretend that came from some other organization. Let's attach that collection. And we have to go in and find all of the databases. We point to the database that we've basically restored this to. We'll say TFS other org. We want to restore that one. Click next. What's the collection name we want to give it? Um, I'm going to keep calling it other org, but I could say other org, that is now my org. Whatever I wanted to change this to, I could. Click Next. We're going to review some configurations, verify it, and attach it. All right, we're done. It passed. It was successfully attached, and we can close this. We now have the new TPC attached to our existing team project or to our existing infrastructure. We can check out, and yes, indeed, the team projects have moved over with it. So in this demonstration, we've done a basic move. We've taken a, we've detached our database, or sorry, we've detached the TPC, we've backed up the database, we've moved that database to a new location, we restored the database into SQL Server in the new TFS environment, we've gone to the new TFS environment's app tier, and we've attached that collection. In this demonstration, we're going to be walking through creating a new team project. Now, team projects are required for basically doing software development with Team Foundation Server. It's a container that holds things like work items, automated builds, source code control. Those sorts of things are all wrapped inside of a team project. And people can only connect to one team project at a time. So you organize your team projects in such a way that it supports software development in your organization. Let's get into the demo. I'm going to open up Visual Studio. And to create a new team project, it's in the same place that you would connect to new team projects. So it's that little plug-in button. We'll click that plug-in button for connecting to team projects. And there's a Create a Team Project link. Let's select that. And we're going to go through the process of creating a new team project. We'll call this our 
active project, for lack of a better term. This is just our name. You might put in a description. Description goes here. And continue on. Now, in this demonstration, we're laying out a full one. So we'll be doing SQL Server reporting services as well as a SharePoint portal. So let's take a look. We've got some options here, Scrum, Agile, and CMMI. For this demonstration, let's spin up an MSF for Agile software development team project. Click Next. Do we want to create a SharePoint site, and where do we want it to be? Now, here's the default it's going to go to, the site's WAC default collection, WAC active project. We can actually configure that from here and place it in a different directory or a different location if we so desire. We're going to leave it where it is, however, and click Next. Now, we don't have to specify a reporting site. If reporting is enabled in TFS, it'll automatically create that site for us. Next, we need to choose which version control system we're using. In TFS 2012, you didn't have this option. Everything was Team Foundation version control. However, in 2013, Git was introduced. So we can use um, Git as a version control system as well. And we're going to stick with Team Foundation version control for now and click Next. Lastly, we can take a look at all of our settings and click Finish. And this will kick off the process of team project creation. Wait a little while and it'll be complete. Once the new team project is created, we can launch the guidance if we like. We can push Close. And it'll automatically launch any of the guidance that we have for it. It's being redirected for us. And here's some of the guidance that we have. And this lets us know about MSF for Agile Software Development with Visual Studio ALM. I'm going to go ahead and close that. We don't really need that. And I want to show you a couple things. We're tied to this active project at this point that we've created. And we can go take a look at some of those reports by clicking the Reports button. And that brings us to the Reports place here. And we can actually just click Go to Site if we want to just go to the reporting site and see all of the reports that are available to us when we create this new team project. Here are some of the sites that we have. We can go take a look at some bug reports, dashboards, project management reports, etc., like burn down and burn rate, stories, progress, remaining work, etc. So that's where we would go and get our reports. And we'd be able to look at our reports at that point in time. Let's go back to the home again. And there's another place here that we can go. We can go view the web portal for this and the task board. And we also have a document repository. And this really is out in SharePoint. And we can view our document repository, like all of our Excel reports, right from within Visual Studio. Or we can go out and take a look at that at the project portal itself. And when the project dashboard loads, you're going to notice you have um, two empty charts here. I've got a, a task burn down chart. Let me blow that up. And also another burn down chart. And those are both empty. Uh, product backlog, also empty. Here's our report data. It's empty. Uh, basically, any of our reporting stuff isn't going to be working. We can take a look at my dashboard and see what that looks like as well. This shows my current tasks, some important dates, etc. Things like bugs, test cases that are assigned to me, things like that. We can also go in and see the Excel reports. Now we showed how you could get access to them right from within Visual Studio, but you can also see them here on the web. And the Excel reports have a lot of other um, reporting capabilities that are distinct from the reporting services uh, reports that we saw earlier on the separate website, the reporting services website. Once you've taken a look at some of the reports, we go ahead and close out Internet Explorer. And what we've done in this demonstration is we've created a brand new team project, in our case called Active Project, that's both connected to SQL Server reporting services for reports and also SharePoint. Occasionally, a team project collection will need to be split. Now, there's a number of reasons for this. One is you might have a bunch of team projects that are really no longer in use. They might be legacy projects that you just want to archive. You don't want to throw them away, but you do want to archive them and kind of get them out of your team project collection. Another reason to split to TPC is if you're going to take half of it and move it to another team project collection, potentially. I'm sorry, another Team Foundation server, potentially. So you can move TPCs around between servers. We're going to split one, and the reason for our demo is because we want to archive some of our um, 
team projects. Should put them somewhere else. So let's go ahead and do that. First thing we'll do is we're going to open up the Team Foundation Server Administration Console. We're looking at the app tier. Let's drop into the team project collections themselves. And let's take a look at the default collection. I'm going to poke over to Team Projects, and notice I've got a couple. I've got an active project, a legacy project, Tailspin Toys, and the verification project. What I'd like to do is just keep active project and Tailspin Toys around and delete or get rid of legacy project and verification project, but I don't want to lose any of their history. So how do I do that? Well, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go back to this general tab and we're going to stop the collection so we can do some maintenance. Let's give a reason for it. We'll just call it doing maintenance. And that's if anybody tries to connect to it, they'll get that, that message, that warning. Once the collection is stopped, you'll see it's been moved to offline. We're then going to detach that collection. Now, this is a fairly big process. So as I click next, we're going to do a quick review of the configuration. And it's going to give me a, a little warning here, which I can check. And it says, we have SQL Enterprise features enabled. In other words, you're moving from here to another SQL Server. You better have SQL Enterprise over there as well. Now, there's some things I can do if I do want to move to a standard one. But this is just a fair warning that's saying you got a little bit of additional work to do if you're going to move to SQL Standard. In our case, we're simply making an archive, so we're going to be staying on our same SQL Enterprise. So that's okay. We can kind of ignore that. And then we click Detach. Now, it does a bunch of work. And as part of this work, detaching the team project, it is taking references away from things like um, the environment that I'm in, my Team Foundation in installation, and it's replacing those in the collection database, the TFS underscore uh, default collection database. It's pulling all that stuff out and replacing it with basically placeholders so that I can attach it later to any other Team Foundation server. So I've got a couple warnings. Um, you, you often are going to find warnings on the SharePoint one. It basically is going to tell me, yeah, I failed to detach from this from the, the active portal. A lot of times this has to do with security. Um, we're going to ignore this for now. We're just going to say, eh, that's all right, and let's close it. Um, the reason it's safe to ignore is um, we're not taking any of that SharePoint data with us. So that it would need to be backed up separately and brought with us anyway. So this is literally just a pointer to those locations. So just fair warning, you're not bringing over that SharePoint stuff when you do this detach. It's just taking over the TFS stuff. You would need to take, take all of your documentation with separately. So let's click Next. We have that warning. We have that SharePoint products warning. And we can click Close. We now are going to see that that disappeared. Our default collection is no longer available as part of our Team Foundation server implementation. Now, that database, however, is still there. So the next thing we need to do is move to the database tier and start to do work from there. Now we've moved over to the Team Foundation Server database tier, and we're going to open it up and note that we have our TFS default collection database. Now it's been detached from TFS, so it's not part of that organization. What we're going to do here is run through a couple of tasks. We're going to basically back this thing up. So let's go to backup. We're going to do a full backup. We'll just leave all of the defaults and click OK, and that will back up our default collection. Now, there's a number of different ways to do backups. I'm going to go ahead and do it this, this way. Um, you could also use you know, a script, of course, or anything of that nature. Now, I'm just doing it right with the UI. At this point, the default collection, um, we can do a couple things with it. We can decide to uh, take it offline if we want for a bit, uh, or we could potentially detach it and then reattach it later. Um, what's going to happen is when we restore our new database in SQL Server 2012, there's a little uh, configuration thing uh, that we'll have to do here. I'm going to leave it. We'll run into the error, and I'll show you how to overcome that error. Um, there are a lot of ways. Again, you might want to be restoring these databases instead with a script to do it appropriately. But in our case, we're going to restore this database, and we'll pick the database we want to restore, the default collection. We're going to want to make sure we change this to TFS Archive to do that collection upgrade. And then we're going to need to go to files because when we do that restore, we either need, it's going to try to write, write over 
some of these files. Notice it's going to restore, try to restore it on top of this default collection.mdf. We're going to change this to archive, so it'll move it to archive, and we're going to do the same thing with the log files. Wherever it says default collection, we're going to replace that as archive. At this point, we've, we've completed all of the things we need to do. We can come back here and hit enter, and it will do the restore for us and bring us back to our new database. Now we'll have a TFS archive database. There we go, it's restored successfully. Now I mentioned that if you're on SQL Server 2012, you might run into this. Notice it's still trying to restore this TFS default collection. Um, that occurs as part of that uh, process. We didn't detach it, we didn't, we didn't take it offline. So the restore somehow got that a little bit confused. Let's re go back to tasks, and what we can do is we can just simply go back to restore that database and just take all the defaults, hit enter, and let it do that restore of that database as well. Again, we could have detached that thing before and made a copy any number of ways. The bottom line is that we have to go into SQL Server and make sure that we make a copy of that detached database. So now we've got one called TFS Archive and we've got one called TFS Default Collection. Now, let's go back to the Team Foundation Server application tier. Configuring an effective disaster recovery plan is one of the important things you need to do with Team Foundation Server. With the advent of 2013, it's gotten a lot easier than it has been in the past. Let's take a look at how we can configure for backup and recovery and basically set that structure up. So let's start by opening up the administration console. Now I'm on the application tier and I want to take a look at what our structure looks like and what we're going to care about. So basically on this application tier, I can see that I'm running as this account. I can see my websites, etc. I can see my server URL, web access URLs, all of those sorts of things, and my machine name. Now, as I scroll down, some of these things are going to matter more than others. And one of those is the data tier summary. So the data tier says, this is the data tier. It's running on a separate machine. So I've got an app tier and I've got a data tier, and they're running on a different box. If I look down here further, notice I've got 28 and 32. These two servers are both application tiers. So this installation of TFS has two application tiers and a database tier. So when I'm thinking of backup and restore and disaster recovery, that's the architecture I need to think about. Now the beautiful thing about Team Foundation Server is that virtually everything is backed up very cleanly and nicely using the scheduled backups utility. So we can go take a look at that scheduled backups utility. Now here, um, I've got a full backup and let's go ahead and uh, disable these scheduled backups and create instead our brand new scheduled backup utility. So I'm going to create one from scratch. Um, this is another part of the video as well. Um, after doing an install in this course, we also set one of these up. But I want to kind of walk you through what we need to do. Basically, we need to schedule a backup. We're going to backup our database. And then once that's done, we'll come back in and restore those databases and create our application tier so that we can come back and get our data back. Um, in this demonstration, I just want to talk briefly about the overview of what we do. We back up the database, and then in a disaster recovery type situation, we're going to need to restore those databases and potentially restore our application tiers. We've got two application tiers, like I mentioned, so we only need one for TFS to operate. So in a disaster recovery, we'll spin one up first and then connect to it. But we also have to make sure that our database has those appropriate databases available. So if we have this disaster recovery, we can still get back to those databases. So in this brief overview, we've taken a look at 
our SQL Server environment. We've got two application tiers and a database, and we've talked a little bit about what we need to do to schedule backups so we can restore once we have uh, a disaster, potentially. And in later sections, we'll dive into more details. One of the most important parts of your disaster recovery plan is backing up your database. Basically, all that goodness is in your database, your version control, your work items, information about your builds. So much of your infrastructure goes right into that database. And we're going to want to make sure we have it backed up so we can restore it appropriately in the event of a complete and utter failure. So to back up our databases, we can do several different ways. Um, one way is to walk through and do SQL Server backups at the root, just kind of core SQL Server backups. However, if you do that, I want to raise a big old flag. There's a couple steps you need to go through. You need to make sure you set some new stored procs in there to, to basically synchronize all of those databases so that when you do the backups, they're not out of sync because you're backing up multiple databases. I'm going to refer you to the documentation if you choose to go that route. The easiest route to go is simply to go into the Team Foundation Server Administration Console, go to Scheduled Backups, and create a backup schedule. So we're going to drop things into this network path, this TFS Backups network path. We're going to retain things for 30 days. We're going to use the BAK file extension. And for any transactions, we'll use a TRN extension. We then are going to select whether or not to include our reporting databases in the backup. Why not? I'm going to go ahead and include all of those. And if we do that, we're going to want to use the SQL Server Reporting Services encryption key. And I've got that key, and I'm going to continue to use that key to back it up. Or we could create a new Reporting Services encryption key. If you've never exported one before, this will be grayed out, and it'll force you to do this one. And we're going to just use our existing one. Now, do we want to take in our SharePoint databases? Absolutely. That's got the documentation and other sorts of things. Most people treat that as part of their overall TFS implementation. Except if you happen to have SharePoint hosted externally to your TFS server. If you're using an enterprise SharePoint server somewhere, which I highly recommend, that backup and recovery might be done by the SharePoint team and not you. If that's the case, you can unclick these and we won't include SharePoint as part of our backup. Now, given the architecture we have, SharePoint's hosted locally, so we could include it, or we could say that, you know, maybe it's an off-site SharePoint implementation. We don't want to include it. I'll go ahead and include that as part of our backup. We'll click Next. Uh, do we want to send alerts if the backup fails? Yes, absolutely. If the job succeeds, eh, we don't need an alert. We can then look at the schedule and whether we want to do manual backups only. Totally don't recommend that. Nightly full backups, which will run a backup every single night, or running on a custom schedule. Probably want to do a custom schedule unless the nightly backups are good enough. A custom schedule will do a full backup on Sunday, then we can do a differential backup on all these other days so that at 2 a.m. you get a nice solid backup, a, a full backup, a differential. And then if you like, you can do a transactional backup every 15 minutes. Now, for the purposes of our discussion, it can, you can do any of these. The custom one means you'll never lose more than 15 minutes of data. But I'm going to go with just a nightly full backup. Click Next. Review all of my structure where I'm going to TFS Backups. Click Next. Validate my readiness checks. Yep, all looks good. And configure. Appropriate access and make sure everything's okay so that we can run our backups. Success, everything completed. We can click next. Just view our um, results if you like. And we can close it. Now one of the things we're going to want to do is take a full backup now. I think this is a great idea right off the get-go because this is going to give you that backup that you can then use to restore. You might as well start with one right now. All right, at this point, our full database backup succeeded, and we can close our window. We have now completed a full backup, and we're ready to let it go onto our schedule now and continue backing up every night. There are a few cases where TFS can fail, and let's take a look at those and when we're going to need to do a recovery. Now, 
I've spent a lot of years with Team Foundation Server, worked with hundreds of customers, and in very, very few cases have I ever seen TFS fail. It's usually a hardware failure, most often self-inflicted. I've only seen three uh, failures. Um, in two of those cases, it was hosted on a virtual machine environment and someone went in and either shut down the virtual machine environment, which took down TFS, or they did something that was uh, relatively silly, like changing the size of the hard disks while the virtual machine was running with snapshots in Hyper-V. Used to be a big problem. Only one case has it ever been a true hardware failure, um, and that was a case where TFS was actually running on a machine under someone's desk. It was a an old developer box that had, you know, wasn't powerful enough to run for the developers, and they had installed TFS on it, and we got a frantic call when it uh, broke down. That's an extreme rarity. In in most cases, hardware is extraordinarily reliable, and TFS is is very, very reliable from a software package. But let's take a look. You might have a lightning strike. You might have a flood that takes out a data center. Who knows? Let's take a look at what it would take to do that recovery. So in this section, we're going to talk a little bit about what that recovery would look like. So let's fire up our Team Foundation Server Administration Console. There's a lot of different ways to install and configure TFS. And in all those cases, we can figure out how to do a restore. The most difficult is when you have everything installed on a single application tier database, everything's installed on a single machine. Um, very easy install, but if it fails, you basically need to reinstall Team Foundation Server all the way from the ground up to do the restore. Second way we might have it is a collection like we have ours. Um, our application tier, if we go out and just take a look at our, our structure, we have um, a database machine that's separate from our application tier. So we're on an application tier at 14, uh, 19, 428, and we have a database that's stored separately on a 19430, that's the name of that machine. And then we also have redundant application tiers. And uh, because of the redundancy in the application tiers, if any one goes down, we will still have access to TFS. So because we've got a fairly strong setup here, our chances of stuff going down are pretty slim, but we've got a couple failure modes. First is we lose an application tier. So we're going to drop an application tier here and we're going to reinstall it and show how we can recover a lost application tier. That'll be in another, another demonstration after this overview. Next problem we have is what happens if our SQL Server goes down? We have a data tier at 19.430. What if we have a catastrophic failure on our data tier? How do we recover? Now, one of the things I want to uh, remind everyone is we have set up our scheduled backups. And our scheduled backups appear here and you can see all of the databases that we are backing up. We've got a lot of application tiers, a lot of other things. And it, before we start these next two demonstrations, I'm going to take a full backup of all of our databases right now, just so we have the latest and greatest. So in this demonstration, we've talked a little bit about application tiers and databases and, and where the failure points are. And we're preparing for doing a recovery on two modes. One is a failed database. One is a failed application tier. And the, the thing we discussed first is if you have everything on one machine, it's very similar. You're going to have to reinstall SQL Server and reinstall Team Foundation Server before you can do the recovery. In this demonstration, we're going to recover a failed application tier. And to fail the application tier, we're going to go to our core application tier. This is the one we first installed. It's our primary application tier, 19.428. It's right here. And we are going to tear down the entire application tier. We're going to pretend that this machine is destroyed. It's got some kind of failure. Something has happened. And to simulate that, we are going to uninstall this application tier. We're just going to take it down. We're not going to do any protection first. We're just going to uninstall the whole thing. And we're not going to tell the SQL Server instance or the configuration just as though this thing has dropped. So let's go ahead and uninstall this from this computer. We're going to choose to uninstall Microsoft Team Foundation Server.
Now that we've uninstalled Team Foundation Server, we have an application tier that is now gone. We can't get to it. You can see our application tier here. If we try to refresh, our administration console is basically gone. Let's close it. And if we try to browse to it or anything like that, we no longer have that application tier available to us to do any work with. That application tier is now gone. So if we have a failed application tier, we can just go to our secondary application tier and use that, that's fine. And if we have a, a virtual IP that load balances between them, no one will have noticed the difference on the outage. However, if we have a single application tier, we'll need to recover it. And TFS is so incredibly easy to recover. It's just like we're scaling it. All we have to do is just install an application tier. When the app tier goes down, all we do is we simply load up that disk with Team Foundation Server. As long as we have a disk with Team Foundation Server on it, we're going to reinstall Team Foundation Server. Accept the license term. And now we uninstalled the main TFS server right from our box here. We're now going to go in and simply reinstall it as an application tier. So failure in our case simply involves adding another application tier. It could be on this machine. It could be on another machine. It could be on the failed machine after you've, you know, rebooted it and paved it, done whatever you want. It doesn't really matter. Excellent. Now that we've installed TFS, we merely need to go in for recovery to go to our application tier only. A couple things. You want to restore Team Foundation Server disaster recovery. It kind of leaves it out there right for you. So let's go ahead and start that wizard. It says here it is. We're doing a data tier only. Click next, point to the database, point to the configuration database, as long as the database is still up. If not, we will have needed to do a slightly different approach to installing TFS, but in this case, we have our database. Specify that we're gonna use our network service account again. Change our file cache folder if we like. Again, this is just stuff that is part of doing an application tier install. Run the readiness checks. And configure TFS. When it's done configuring, we click next. We can take a look at it. We've got our Team Foundation server URL now. It completed successfully. We can close it, close this, and it'll automatically fire up our administration console. And if we look down our administration console, we'll see a lot of similar looking things. We've now recovered our application tier. And we have our data tier, we're still pointing to that data tier, and our application tier is now back up. We have our 1428 on our application tier, and we're set. So in this demonstration, we've done a recovery of a failed application tier. And once again, it's pretty much just the same as scaling out your infrastructure. You're just installing an application tier and pointing it to an existing database. If we didn't have two application tiers, or if all our app tiers failed, it would be the same thing simply spinning up a new application tier and pointing it to those databases.